pith of cluff is thus. I thought about titling uh, this talk, Why We Cry. As infants, we seek recognition, or we seek attention for survival. And as we mature, our strategies for achieving attention and recognition become more sophisticated. I think that it's worth articulating my ideology here to give my public uh, something tangible to identify with. Attention, recognition, identification, self as public currency are essential functions within culture. Think pop stars, sports figures, and politicians, those through whom we imaginatively interact with to make meaning. My hazy youthful ideals have clarified into something more specific. When I was 20, I had a life-changing vision of righteous artisthood, which evolved into Cluffalo, which is where the true, the good, and the beautiful embrace head, heart, and hands. I've come to realize the influence of conductors of spiritual generosity, such as Albert Hubbard, and my parents. Uh, I've also experienced it through Larry Griffiths Jr. and the Ashford Hollow Foundation, Dr. Gerald O'Grady and Media Studies at UB, Robert Buck, former director of the Albright Knox and Brooklyn Museums, Dr. Edna Lindemann, founder of the Birchfield Penny Art Center, and many artists and writers. Uh, not necessarily perfect people, but those who helped establish my values. So they are conductors rather than leaders, in my mind, in the sense that their direction has been more oblique and inferential than explicit. Spiritual in the sense of ultimate concern and generous insofar as their influence was non-transactional. To set the stage of my concerns, I'll point out the following concepts and writers. The biological imperatives are the needs of living organisms required to perpetuate their existence. These include survival, territorialism, competition, reproduction, quality of life seeking, and group forming. Living organisms that follow and succeed in satisfying these imperatives are adaptive. Those that don't are terminal. I believe art is a tiny piece of this. I see it as an adaptation to make life possible and to make space for connection, community, and creativity. Through art, networks of association and identification take form. My youthful experience of the institutions of family, church, school, and culture predisposed me towards idealism. I can't overemphasize the importance of self-criticality, such as I'm capable. Um, in my visionary moment, I rejected directives towards a safer and more predictable adulthood. After a year in art school at Pratt Institute, I realized my way forward would be through adhering to structure of intentionality, enacted through attending art exhibitions, exchanging studio visits, reading all imaginably related literature, and determining the parameters of my art. The literary critic Harold Bloom, who died a couple weeks ago, calls this free self-creation. Over the course of my development as an artist, I've drawn extensively from the fields of psychology, sociology, aesthetics, and philosophy. I want to highlight the writers whose ideas reson resonate and have shaped my work and thought. A teacher at Ontario College of Art that I attended in 71-72 directed me toward the philosopher John Dewey. His 1934 book, Art as Experience, is a reliable introduction to the context of art. 
My personal artist experience starts in toddlerhood and passes through a sequence of thresholds of realization like the one I mentioned above. In 1973, I read Richard Ornstein's The Nature of Human Consciousness, a brief history of the study of intelligence, including, for example, musical in, in the types of intelligence, including musical intelligence, spatial intelligence, etc. Gardner opened my mind to the variety and richness of the various intelligences and led me to conclude that I would add pictorial or imagistic intelligence. My sense of artisthood involves a sense of total commitment and having a deliberate course of action. The deepest sense of the making of meaning is my objective in this effort. I think of this in terms bounded by freedom on the one hand and the social contract on the other. My sense of freedom grows out of everything that play implies. My sense of ethical meaning grows out of the golden rule and understanding the value of forgiveness. After getting a grip on cognitive concerns, for me, a sense of personality development has been essential in understanding how we are able to make meaning. Freud's formulation of id, impulse, superego, fear, and ego, will, are useful. I add a fourth layer, the artist's ego, which is literally to make history through the artworks left behind. My sense of artisthood is something I personally developed, but it was shaped by Otto Rank's art and artist, creative urge and personality development. Chapters begin with um, creative urge and personality development and conclude with beauty and truth, the artist uh, fight with art, success and fame, and deprivation and renunciation. This is where the true, the good, and the beautiful snuck up on me in reading Art and Artist. Historically, in 1853, Victor Cousin, whoever he was, published his lectures on the true, the good, and the beautiful. It's a compelling statement of these three values as they're derived from Greek philosophy. Crucial to understanding how art functions is the relation of form and content. Philosophy in a New Key, 1952, and Feeling and Form, 1957, by Suzanne Langer, addresses the art forms, painting, sculpture, music, theater, literature, dance, and architecture, considered as a group of activities done by people with skill and imagination, and how the relationship of form and content functions in each of the arts. Painting is my expressive concern. I mentioned ultimate concern above. I use it to reference the yearning for goodness that is commonly associated with religious faith. I had a sense of this before I read Paul Tillich's Dynamics of Faith, 1957, but this book articulates the concept more fully. The disconnect between market economics and gift economics is the subject of Lewis Hyde's The Gift, Imagination and the Erotic Life of Property, 1983, which defends the value of creativity and its importance in a cultural culture increasingly governed by money and overrun with commodities. The Artful Mind, Cognitive Science, and the Riddle of Human Creativity, edited by Mark Turner in 2006, with 14 contributors, considers culture of the past 50,000 years. Human cultures can be regarded as massive distributed cognitive networks involving the linking of many minds, often with large institutional structures that guide the flow of ideas, memories, and knowledge. Artists are traditionally at the forefront of that process and have a large influence on our worldviews and mental models. 
artists may sometimes have the illusion of separateness, of isolation from society, but in reality, they have always been society's early warning devices. The best of them are connected and more deeply enculturated <coughs> than most. It follows that the sources of their creativity, although partly personal, are also public, outside the nervous system, in the distributed system itself, that is, in culture, which encompasses but supersedes the individual nervous system. Both Freud and Rank, uh, oh, beyond Freud and Rank, other psychoanalytic writers, Melanie Klein, D.W. Winnicott, Heinz Kohut, Hans Lowald, and others are important to my ideology. For example, Lowald's Sublimation, 1988, we know of a far more expedient process of development called sublimation, in which the energy of the infantile wishful impulses is not cut off, but remains ready for use. The unserviceable aim of the various impulses being replaced by one that is higher and perhaps no longer sexual. It happens to be precisely the components of the sexual instinct that are specially marked by a capacity for this kind of sublimation, for exchanging their sexual aim for one another, or for another one, which is comparatively remote and socially valuable. It is probable that we owe our highest cultural successes to the contributions of energy made in this way to our mental functions. Okay, the above relates to the true. With regard to the good, I'll briefly quote Richard Rorty from his Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity, 1989. He quoted Judith Sklar, liberals are people who think that cruelty is the worst thing we can do. And John Rawls, a brief inquiry into the meaning of sin and faith, 2009, as sin is the separation from and the destruction of community and therefore personality, so faith is the integration into and reconstruction of community. The proper antithesis is between sin and faith. Sin is that closedness which bears the fruit of wicked actions, whereas faith is that openness which flowers into the complete fullness of communal life. As to the beautiful, I don't know how to describe it. As Justice Stewart said in his 1964 ruling in relation to obscenity, I'll simply point to the. What the fuck? <laughs> Did I say that? <clears throat> you, you failing computer, you. Anyway, oh, I, I, I give up. Um, <laughs> Fill in the blank. Um, anyway, those those images that you were watching, I guess I should have clicked, um, um, you know. Repeat. Repeat, thank you. Okay. So uh, I have a sense uh, in the broad view of art uh, to be, uh, in, a, in a sense, I have a sense that in the broad view, art can be understood in terms of mise-en-scene the elements of theatrical of a th theatrical production. Art is a prop within the course of society through time. The character of the artist is demonstrated through his or her oeuvre, ideology, and biography. Ultimately, it's the gestalt, something that is made of many parts and yet is somehow more than or different from the combination of the parts broadly of these elements that make meaning. Of course, the gestalt for, say, Picasso or Warhol forms subjectively in each of us, but a general consensus happens in which the artist's name stands for a flood of meanings. I seek attention through my work. When one declares one's dedication to art, two things come to mind. A big lazy cop-out or a painstaking quest. A delusion 
or a nearly impossible journey. It took me five years to determine my job description, which is to make the photographic epic of a painter as a film or a ghost. Pep fog. I have taken photos since 1968. I've lived an epic arc as a painter, and the film is theoretically at least a flipbook animation of every one of my images. Probably an impossibility, but a fantasy that I nurse. Sometimes works. My <laughs> focus as a painter is on the painterly, a highly specialized instance within the larger domain of culture. I understand it as enigmatic ambiguity in compelling color shape. Color shape is hyphenated. I like to play with pareidolia, the tendency to perceive a specific, often meaningful image in a random or ambiguous visual pattern. While I am able, my deepest desire is to continue to produce art limited only by space and access to materials. Your support of me in every way, including the patronage of my work, enables me to keep that expression in paint flowing. I've had studios in New York, Rhode Island, and Buffalo, and now our paths cross here at the Roycroft. What, I, what sense do I have of that? Albert Hubbard and the Roycrofters were explicitly progressive. A glance at the Roycroft platform reveals their focus on health, happiness, brotherhood, cooperation, votes for women, and universal peace. Somewhere at the bottom of their cultural entrepreneurial creative enterprises were core values in some conflict with prevailing societal norms. As the Roycroft campus has been pre preserved and come back to life, much has been made of the, of the motto, head, heart, and hands. Someone, some think St. Francis, some think of an attorney uh, in the early part of the 20th century said, he who works with his hands is a laborer. He who works with his hands and head is a craftsman. He who works with his hands and his head and his heart is an artist. Albert Hubbard adopted this with uh, an egalitarian spin. This, is, this motto has been meaningful for, to, for numerous people who have worked over the last decade to give this place, this place, new life and to keep the program rooted in the creative. My slant on this is to cast head, heart, and hands in terms of gesture as meaning. In some ways parallel to dance and other nonverbal kinesthetic expression. My public painting workshop here at the Roycroft is both a progressive approach to the authorship of art and an image generator that occupies the special location of the studio. Here I share my most intimate, intimate spot with any who wish to engage the painting. The real pith is in locating ultimate concern in the execution of the painterly. I understand this as a moment of numinous eudaimonia. Numinous as derived from the Latin numen, meaning a deity or spirit presiding over a thing or space. It describes the power or presence or realization of a divinity. And eudaimonia from the Greek meaning achieving the best conditions possible for a human being in every sense, not only happiness, but also virtue, morality, and a meaningful life. It was the ultimate goal of philosophy to become better people, to fulfill our unique potential as human beings. It's not a panacea, just a little touch of wonder. The artist makes a name that has a multitude of meanings. If the meanings are simultaneously true, good, and beautiful, the artist has provided value for the community and earned recognition. The risk will always be in failing to reach the critical mass of awareness in the minds of the public 
which makes that possible. There you have it. You can press that button.